Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for March 24th, 2021. It is my pleasure to be joined once again with Andre Green, Chair of the Somerville School Committee. Andre, the weather's getting better, our dispositions are getting better. What do you think? I mean, I'm probably in better spirits. I think, um, you know, be able to go for walks, get out of, you know, my apartment where I live and work. Yeah, I think all of us are, think spring is, I don't want to say spring has sprung, but it's definitely in the process of doing so. It's looking good to me, no matter what. Mid-March is looking very good to me. Yeah. Andre, you have some uh, very exciting news that you're going to be updating the general public about. Uh, mainly around the school reopening plan. Um, I want to start off with first, we have been open um, in a very selective way. Our classrooms have been populated in a very small way, uh, beginning, and I think most people don't realize this, beginning as far back as February 1st, we started to bring back some high needs students. And that has been on a rolling basis through February into March. Um, and as recently as March 22nd, bringing in the pre-K and the kindergarten folks. So it's not as if we've been sitting back doing nothing, but the major announcement I think you're gonna be talking about today is the Department of Education, Secondary Education, DESI, if we say that and people don't understand what it is. Um, uh, DESI was accepting waiver applications from school districts across Massachusetts in order to delay the April 5th mandate reopening. Right. You wanna take it away from there if I got the dates right? Sure, so um, as of this morning, the, uh, the, the department has approved 56 district waivers, um, which is you know roughly a quarter of, the, quarter of the state, which, you know, I think, depending on how you want to spin it, you just spin that as, look, most most states, most districts are ready to, to go back, or you made a policy that, that you know, a quarter of districts can't live up to, um, to do notify of their own, uh, including, and, you know, of those three, six, sorry, was included, um, so we have a timeline for, re, for return to full in person, um, the plan will, that we will continue to phase in hybrid, uh, as you said, pre-K starts this week, um, first grade and second grade will start next week with the idea that everyone will have, have at least some time in hybrid between now and, and April break, and we will come back in April break full in, full in person. Um, part of the reason for this, you know, I, part of the reason that the state granted these waivers is that a full 30 districts, including Somerville, had been mostly remote and not entirely remote all year. Um, I think 30, 30 of us were still had students that were mostly in remote. Um, of note, and I want to point this out because no one, I, no one's going to explain why. Other districts that have been fully remote, like Boston and Worcester, are still being reviewed. Um, and you know, I think it was correct for the district district to apply for a waiver. And I think correct for, for the uh, state to grant us one because the reality is, that you you know, going from zero to, to full for a district is not an easy task. A smaller district with more up-to-date facilities and less high needs students may be able to do it much more quickly right. than a more complicated educational district like Somerville. Right, which is why it's, it is to me somewhat confusing that, that Worcester and Boston, who are obviously larger and more complicated than even Somerville, are still waiting for their for work feedback from Desi, but you know, we'll, we'll learn that in time. I think. You know, that's 100% true is that, you know, it's complex. It's also true that in Somerville, because of the complexity and robustness of our testing regime, it takes time to ramp it up to scale, right? Like, you know, there are things that we know testing even 500 students a week that we can't know if those will scale at 5,000 until we start doing it. So being able to do that in stages and actually get our testing regime up and running before push, pushing on 5,000 students being tested you know, twice, you know, having tested once a week and students staffing, te uh, 1100 staffing tested twice a week, th there's gonna be some growing pain. So having some time to work those out, I think is important. I think it's like anything, Andre. I mean, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts learned very quickly in their rollout of the vaccines 
that when you try to do something very, very quickly without thinking through the consequences of what you're doing, it can fall flat in its face. And we saw that with Governor Baker's vaccine rollout. Right, right? And, I, and I think it's important to remember that if, if, if and when we fail, you know, when we make mistakes, we're gonna make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, when we fail, we know who gets disproportionately hurt, right? It, you know, and so like, when I, I said that to responsibility very seriously. And so like, if it means it takes us another two weeks, ultimately that's for two weeks to make sure we're not failing our immigrant families and our communities of color, our high needs students, you know, that to me is a trade-off that I would take to take any day of the week. Yeah, so, so I wanna stick with kind of the concrete things that we know now, right? What we now know is that City of Somerville School District has been given the waiver that we requested from Desi. We will roll kids back in um, during the month of March. Um, we will be taking a little bit of a break in April because of school vacation week. But by April 27th, 28th, the plan is to have all pre-K through eight kids back full in-person learning. That is correct. Okay. Um, and I want to be clear that I think, you know, as we, as we learned from the, the rolling, rollout of the hybrid, people are happy to be back, right? Teachers are happy to be back. Students are happy to be back. Um, right, like we, we are happy to be, to, to be maintaining in-person learning. Um, you know, I think we, we have a plan that I think is the most aggressive plan possible to do that return to in-person learning in a way that is safe and sustainable. My apologies, sorry. I, I get it, I know. <laughs> sorry, I usually it's shut it off. Different things to do. <laughs> um, so, so here's why I asked the question, um, and some people may ask the district and you, you know, on the school committee, why so long? Why is it gonna take us so long till the end of April to do this? I look at the other side of this, Andre, and say, if we only gave a week's notice, if we were ready from the physical plant side and the teacher's side, and the, 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 if we were ready, how fair would it be to the parents to say, okay, we got our plan, all your kids back in next week, full in person. So I think that's I think that's true, and I think I, I, you know understated part of this. Um, you know, I I think about like my my day job where the offices are still closed, and they decided in uh, January that it, since they couldn't guarantee those would be ready at the end of March, they would postpone reopening till August. Right, like, and it's that very reason, right? Like, they like it's not fair for us to say, "Hey, we need you back in the office in two weeks," because we have staff who have moved to, you know, have gone back to California, or, you know, moved to a family for whatever reason. And giving them time to come back is important. Um, and similarly, we have we have families in the district that you know may or you know we know aren't still physically in the district um, for you know whatever reasons. This is a, a year of of lots of people. And giving them time to come back is important. Um, giving families time to figure out a new normal is important. Um, giving and, 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 and giving uh, students like students who haven't been in a building for a year, asking to come back to five days in person, six days, six hours a day, didn't seem fair, right? Like, so the, part of the hybrid is also to get students back in the habit of being in school. Um, and yeah, the re more important, important educational lesson than perhaps another couple of days of in person. The reason I brought it up on ter in terms of giving people enough time to react to the new schedules goes like this: very close friend of mine is a public school teacher in the Boston district. She also has two children within the. K through eight system in Somerville. She has been required to go back on a certain date for in person. Right. What does she do with her two children who still will be at home in a hybrid session? 
That's the complicated issue for families. And that's that, that, it's a fair one. I think it goes, you know, that's definitely a place like, that's both ways. Like, you know, for every family that I think, and we've heard, definitely heard from these families who are really glad for the phased in, phased in return, there are families who is 100% true. A phased in return means they, they just come out with a plan for the short term and then another plan for, for, for post April break. And that's, it's true. That, that's tough for families. Um, you know, I, you know, I think that's, that's for me, you know, a metaphor for the pandemic as a whole, which is that the end is in sight, but we're not done yet, right? Like the toughness isn't over yet. Um, and I think, you know, the district is always making, I think, especially this year, but always has to make tough trade-offs, right? Like if there was a path that made everyone happy, we would just take it. But every decision we're gonna make and every choice we make, there are people who are who it's gonna be easier and harder for, and we just have to figure out how to do that, how to make those hard calls in an equitable, equitable way. Okay. So a couple of more concrete kind of questions. Um, have all of the parents or caregivers of our student population been notified of the schedule? I mean, it, it is my hope. Um, you know, I think obviously there are almost certain families we've missed, but I know that our SFOC is working overtime to reach out directly to our immigrant families and our non-speaking families. Um, we are sending out, you know, all our information at this point on an almost daily basis. Um, and again, I think that's part of the reason we're glad for the increased rollout time is that, you know, you know, emails and surveys and things like this do a really good job of reaching out to certain parts of our population. But to really get to like a lot of our immigrant families, our poorest families, we haven't found a good substitute for having someone from SFOC, the parent liaison, the school liaisons who know them, call them and usually call them more than once, right? And that just takes time. Um, so well, I, I, I put this offer on the table to the school committee and to the district. Um, if you need the media center's help with getting it across our social media platforms and on television here in Somerville, just sing out. We'll do whatever we can to get the information out. We will take you up on that offer. I know I was, and this is entirely on me, I was supposed to get you a visual of the schedule for, for this chat, and I didn't have the opportunity to do that. But we will definitely follow No, up. I did. If it deviates from what I saw, Andre, one of the news articles linked to Somerville's presentation to yeah. Desi, and it had that slide on it. So yeah. I'll coordinate with whoever contacts us to make sure we have the correct slides. That'd yep. be perfect. That'd be great. Because, um, yeah, I think it is. This is like so many things, this pandemic, it's an all hands on deck situation, right? Um, but, yeah, and again, there will be families, and we know this, and we've gotten one of the things I would say, you know, there are things I think we've, we've definitely improved upon as a district this year that we have to keep forward is that reaching out to immigrant families. We've, we've never been better at it than we are now. And I hope we continue that. And so we want to take this around that'll come, come, come to be important. We can't we can't ignore and skip the step of having families just we're just gonna call them and say, hey, just so you know, this is the schedule, et cetera. Do you have questions? So in terms of the physical plants, I understand we've been utilizing the, the new high school um, over the so past week. Suddenly gorgeous. Yep. Well, I'll get to see it at some point. I'm gonna demand a private tour from the mayor. So how's that? My tax I mean, dollars, my tax dollars at work. Um, I've already had a couple of pictures to ask, ask that of me. I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't have keys, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Um, we'll all get to see it at some point, yeah. Andre. Um, but I guess my question is on the other physical plants, I know there's probably a rolling schedule of which schools are coming back. Um, it's my assumption, and I just want to, not a gotcha question. It's my assumption is that the Brown School is offline for the remainder of this year. So that is not a gotcha question. It's a very good question. Um, let me start from the top, which is that all of our buildings, with the exception of the uh, Winter Hill and the Brown, should be ready to go for the launch. For, for launch. Um, the the Healy was one I was in question. We actually got that done. So, with the exception of the Winter Hill and the Brown, who will be returning to, who will be opening up at the high school, 
kids are going back to their schools. Um, I want to give Rich Rach and his team and all of the city side uh, credit for hustling to get that done. That wasn't necessarily going to be clear as, as recently as even a few weeks ago, but that is the, the situation. As far as the um, Winter Hill, um, you know, the Winter Hill and the Brown are both schools that you know we're constantly looking at to see if perhaps they will be usable this year. In the case of the Winter Hill, a uh, third of the Winter Hill's pro uh, program is special, is special education, and particularly it's our ASD, or so our autism, autism spectrum disorder, and some of our you know highest of high need students at the Winter Hill, and the students we would least want to move again. Um, just that's a disruption they don't need, and since the rooms are specially set up, would be a real disruption moving. Especially since those are also students who we tend to serve through the summer. And over the summer, there will be real work done on uh, HVAC systems at the Winter Hill. So if we move them back to the Winter Hill, we have to move them back to high school for the summer. So I think for the Winter Hill, is, it does not make educational sense to move them once we move them. The Brown is a, is a different case because, you know, there is a deep work that came out of the Brown sort of a massive renovation, uh, which we're not going to be doing right now. Um, so the expectation is that between vaccinations and the, the vaccinations and portable filters and windows and the status of the virus, we will, we will return to the brown as the brown in the brown this fall. That is the assumption, that is, that, that is the working assumption right now. That may change, we're constantly monitoring it, but that is the working assumption right now. The question is, would we move there earlier? Um, and that's still very much an open question. I know the city is meeting with experts. We were looking at options. Okay. Um, but I don't have an answer for you on that one yet. Okay. No, I, I you know, parents ask me. Yeah, you know, no, parents you, ask us all the time. Well, and what do you know? Is, I said, well, I don't know a whole lot about the physical plant of the Brown School. I do know that it is lacking in a lot of things. Right. So um, good news for Winter Hill. You know, one of my close friends is a teacher at the Winter Hill. Um, she has been missing her kids for over a year and she wants to go back in person. Vaccination, let's talk a little bit about one of the issues that we have floating around education or teachers, educators, staff um, wanting to feel safe when they go back in person. Your thoughts about where we are now in terms of vaccinating our educators in the city and where we go into the remainder of the school year and the summer and next fall. What are your thoughts? Sure. I, I, first, I, I think it's just prior weeks. I want to thank the president for providing the pressure needed to get uh, Baker to finally move uh, on getting teachers vaccinated. Um, so, you know, teachers have been eligible for vaccination now since the 11th. Um, it is still a case that, like, the state of doesn't have any vaccines, so we, we can't be, we, we cannot be vaccinating teachers ourselves, although we would love to. Um, and there are districts that somehow got vaccines to do that. And despite our best efforts to figure out how that, how that decision was made, um, it feels like many of this governor's decisions on, on the vaccine, which is that they are ad hoc and no strategy um, and responding to whatever you know pain point he feels that morning. Um, but that's not to say that none of our educators will no. be vaccined because they live in different districts and they've been getting vaccined in their right. own and, hometowns. Right, and, and through CBS again, you know, thanks to the president. So our teachers are certainly getting vaccinated. Um, we are trying to collect that, collect, collect data on, you know, not obviously not identifiable data because that's HIPAA stuff, but trying to get a sense of where our teachers are as far as the process of getting vaccinated. Um, I don't have them, those numbers to, to hand, but now we're trying to get them. Um, we are certainly, you know, and again, if we could run a clinic of our teachers, we would. We certainly support all efforts to get our teachers vaccinated. Um, and our assumption is, and what we're hearing is that, you know, while we were concerned that maybe teachers, there are teachers who wouldn't, we are not hearing that. So far we're hearing, you know, excitement and eagerness on our teachers part to, to be getting vaccinated. So we expect them to hold out. Andre, when you say we, uh, let me just kind of parse this so it doesn't seem like I'm ganging up on them. The Somerville Educators Union has the best interest of the educators and the kids in their portfolio. Have they weighed in on whether or not they would be in favor of mandating vaccines for the educators? 
so with, with, without running the risk of saying things that may, you know, be exposing future bargaining negotiations, I will say that I've got no sense from SEU that they are opposed to any efforts to mandate or require or in some ways reform, uh, you know, use more of a, of a carrot and stick approach to get teachers vaccinated. But that would require, that is gonna require some kind of legal interpretation from the state level. Uh, namely, I would assume the attorney general has to weigh in on whether or not the school districts can do that. This would be a place where some state leadership would be greatly appreciated, right? Um, you know, I, certainly I believe, and I think yeah, their, their lawyers believe this, that that this is a place where districts have, have that authority as employers. Um, but that is a place where, yes, some guidance from the, from the AG, some actual state state the state acting on this issue would be even better. Um, but like the next time the state leads, supposed to come com, com, command us to, to fall on our swords will be the first. But that is my strong hope that the state actually steps up on this issue. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, there are all kinds of things that we mandate these days, right? You know, I, I can't get onto a plane without taking my shoes off. Um, that's a mandate, whether I like it or not. Um, when I travel, and I think I said this to you before, or I don't know, it might have been President Council President McLaughlin. When I travel to a different country pre COVID, I was mandated to get vaccines for certain things yeah. in order to enter that country. So people who choose not to have to take that into consideration. If you're not going to get a vaccine, you're not going to be entering into that country. Right. That's an individual choice. And like we know, you know, the, the, the case law is clear. We know for a fact that we can, that once, once there's a vaccine for minors, which, which minors there still is not, but once there's a vaccine that is approved for people under, under, under 16, it, we are complete with our rights as we do for other vaccines to acquire them as a, as an, as a requirement for being a student in some of the public schools. Got it. The expectation is that we will do so. Yep. Um, exciting news. I know that the caregivers, the educators, the school committee, the city administration, people who, who work within the education system, all the outlying agencies that work with the school system, I think everyone um, is ready to take these steps. We have been trying baby steps since February 1st. I think everyone's ready to take these steps. And as a cautionary tale, um, we're not out of this yet. Um, people have to understand that it's a cooperative effort. Um, if you all take the vaccine seriously and get the vaccine, um, keep trying to schedule yourself. I know I've gotten bumped twice from a, a schedule that I was on due to lack of vaccine, but news coming out of Washington, coming out of the medical industry, the CDC, clearly indicates that the amount of dosages are being ramped up that we could successfully beat this thing by the end of the summer. But that, is that will only be done if people get the vaccine. And that people and if, and for those of us who don't yet have the vaccine, which I am one of those people, we can't act like it's over, right? Like Swamps gets in full remote this week because there, Swamps Good High had a super spreader, was had a, one of the largest super spreader events in the, in the Commonwealth last weekend, right? Like, we're not done yet. Um, you know, we, we the, the light's at the end of the tunnel, but we're not there yet, and we have to keep that in mind. And it keeps going back, Andre, no matter how hard you work and how hard your colleagues work and the school district works and the restaurant industry works and the mayor works, this cannot be done without responsible behavior by individuals. Right. So when you made reference to the Swampscott issue with the super spreader, that was done outside of the school system. 100%. At a private house party. And those yep. parents, I got to be honest with you, those parents should be held liable for some of this stuff. You know? I, yeah, I think it's important to recognize, and you know, and this is, you know, this asking messaging from us as leaders that Reopening things like schools does not mean returning to normal, right? Um, you know, schools, you know, kids are happy to be back, classes are happy to be back, 
look like our classes do not look like they did in February of, of, of 2020, right? Right. right. Um, and our our behavior as, as as parents, as students, as can't be as it was in February of 2020. We're not there yet. Yep. Um, you know what? But I don't want to bring it down. I want to end on a very very high note um, that Somerville, the Somerville Public School District, uh, has been taking steps to get all of our kids and our educators back into our facilities. Uh, may not be the facility that you're used to seeing, but they're coming back and the due date, uh, according to the waiver that was granted to the city of Somerville, that due date is April 27th, 28th. Yeah. So by um, the end of April. So the one thing I will throw out is that in keeping with our, our, our testing re regime, we are still trying to figure out exactly what what those 27 28 will look like as far as how to make sure everyone is tested and is safe um, to come back in so that news will be forthcoming great andre as always thank you so much hey i heard a rumor can we do yes. rumors today you can do a rumor i heard a rumor you're running for re-election as school committee in ward four this year um that is probably the case. Well, I'm still I'm still weighing things out. Like it's been a rough couple months, but that was not the one I was I was worried you were gonna ask about. But all right. I, well, if you're not gonna answer it, I'm just gonna start the draft, Andre, for school committee. <laughs> Andre, thank that. you so much. Sorry thank to you. put you on the spot there, but I did the same thing to Ben you and Camp in earlier today. <laughs> all right, my, my, Andre. Thank you. For Thank the you. Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Please, as always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.